Good afternoon and welcome to this IIEA seminar. Uh, I welcome all of our listeners today. Um, it's an interesting and very topical question we're going to talk about today. The grey zone, cooperation and collective defence for the 21st century security environment. So it couldn't be more topical than what we're hearing now. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I just want to say all this is on the record and you can join the discussions using your Q&A button on your Zoom facility. And if questions, uh, if, if questions arise in your mind during the discussion, please put them up. And if you can give your identification and your affiliation, if you uh, are speaking on behalf of any group. Um, we're delighted today to be joined by David von Wheel, Assistant Secretary General of the Emerging Security Challenges at NATO, and Oli Rutu, Deputy Chief Executive of the European Defence Agency. And these two very busy gentlemen have taken time out to talk to us. It just struck me that I might just remind ourselves the 21st century security environment is characterized by its com complexity, by the Russians' invasion uh, of Ukraine, um, and it has highlighted in the world and for the world the significant security risks that Europe faces today. Europe is experiencing an increase in the range of security threats which fall below the threshold of war. These hazards, understood as grey zone threats, and I have to say it's a relatively new expression to myself, include information warfare, cyber attacks, military posturing and the manipulation of energy supplies. We have all faced those um, threats. The panel today, our two speakers, David and Ollie, will discuss the ways in which the blurred links between peace and war generated new threats and they will also assist um, assess the measures that can be taken to counter them. Um, and when the two speakers have finished, we will then allow time for questions or comments. And um, I will ask the two speakers to each speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. And I now invite David to open the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nora, and, and good afternoon to all of you from uh, the NATO HQ in Brussels. Um, so my function is I'm the Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges. And that sounds quite ominous as a title, uh, but if I describe it in short to normal people, uh, what I say is that I deal with all the threats that are the non-traditional military threats. Um, so everything short of uh, bullets, uh, tanks, aircraft, uh, and, 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 and fights at sea uh, fall within my remit. Um, so that includes cyber, it includes uh, the innovation war, it includes hybrid warfare, uh, disinformation, energy security, uh, but also the new threat of climate change and, and, and the security aspects of that, uh, counterterrorism. So it's a rather broad portfolio. And I used to start all my speeches that the chance of a large war in Europe, uh, a large conventional conflict in Europe uh, uh, has become very small. Unfortunately, since a month ago, uh, I've had to rewrite my speech. And of course, that's not uh, the big issue. The big issue is that we are confronted with a major conventional conflict uh, on European soil by the biggest country in Europe uh, and the second biggest army in the world, uh, trying to attack uh, a peaceful neighbor, a peaceful democratic neighbor, completely unprovoked uh, with all means. But even in this large scale conventional conflict, uh, for which NATO, of course, was erected at uh, the, the, the end of uh, the Second World War to defend ourselves against such a conflict. Even in that conventional conflict, uh, we see that the gray zone plays a large role. And not only in the conflict itself, but also in the long run up to the conflict itself. The fact that most Russians now support President Putin's war and believe that there are actual Nazis in Ukraine uh, that need to be eradicated, uh, that we re just read that the, the kidnapped mayor of Melitopol uh, was told by the Russian soldiers that kidnapped him, uh, that they were there to free him from the Nazis and where could they find him. So the misinformation, the propaganda that was used as a buildup to this conflict uh, is, is one of those gray zone tools. 
Uh, but also we've seen that our gas storages in Europe have been depleted over the summer. Uh, and that was a, a, a deliberate policy by Gazprom uh, and the Russian government uh, in order to create leverage um, against Western European countries uh, trying to divide us. Uh, we've seen cyber attacks in the run-up. Uh, we've seen preparations. Uh, we've seen hacking of government sites, scaring off the Ukrainian population. Um, and then when the war started, we saw massive attacks on the Ukrainian cyber infrastructure. Uh, that put down their communications, that uh, 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 destabilized their energy uh, uh, grid, um, and that also has some spillover to uh, our uh, part of the world. Uh, one of the hacks, and, and, and today there will be a statement coming out by the US uh, attributing the Viasat hack uh, to the Russian government, uh, but that hack that was intended to disrupt the infrastructure in Ukraine actually also destabilized 5,000 wind turbines off the German coast uh, for a period of 21 days. So the impact of the gray zone, although it sounds rather harmless, um, can be huge and is lock, stock and barrel uh, part of the conflicts that we face uh, uh, today, uh, whether or not accompanied by conventional conflict. So this is not new for us. Uh, however, what is new is the skill we're seeing now. And the fact that the whole European security architecture uh, that we've become accustomed to uh, within the international rule-based order uh, is now being upset uh, by a UN Security Council member uh, that doesn't attribute to the rules of war uh, anymore, that bombs hospitals, that uh, attacks infrastructure and is at least in communications being backed by a second UN Security Council member, namely China, um, uh, is a big worry. Uh, and that means that in the gray zone, uh, we also have to prepare for a more intense competition uh, than we've seen before. Uh, there will be a lower threshold in using all other means than military conflict uh, uh, to uh, uh, achieve goals. Uh, and, and, and of course, we're doing the same. Uh, NATO is not involved in the conflict in Ukraine, uh, but of course, through the delivery of uh, uh, weapons by individual allies, um, by providing humanitarian assistance, uh, uh, by uh, imposing heavy sanctions on the Russian economy, uh, of course, we are using other means than military means in order to achieve our objective. Uh, in this case, not to become involved in a full-on war with Russia, but at the same time, dissuading Russia from uh, this war and trying to assist Ukraine uh, in standing up against Russia. So what are the tools we have for that? And, and, and I'll elaborate shortly in the, in, in the different domains within my division, how we're arming ourselves to that. Cyber, of course, being the most prominent. So already in 2014, uh, we have declared cyber an operational domain, next to the land domain, the air domain, uh, and, and the sea domain. We recognize that cyber uh, is a domain in which battles uh, might take place. We also declared in 2016 uh, that a cyber attack may be seen as an armed attack. And an armed attack in NATO means that Article 5 can be triggered, which is the Three Musketeers article, one for all and all for one, which means that the collective self-defense would then be triggered. But we also noticed that in cyberspace, it's sometimes not the one detrimental large-scale attack uh, that happens uh, and that really harms us. Uh, it can be campaigns, malicious campaigns uh, that are below that threshold of armed attack that can be just as destabilizing. Um, and the Viaset hack I just mentioned was one of them, but also the hack on the Microsoft Exchange server, which we attributed to China, uh, is, is one of the examples where hacks can have a detrimental effect, wanted or unwanted, uh, to uh, the security of our nations. Uh, if hospitals don't have power because they're being hacked, then people die. Um, so what we did last year uh, in our updated cyber defense policy is declare that even a campaign of lower level malicious cyber activities by the same actor uh, could in some circumstances amount uh, to the same level of an armed attack. And the reason for this is to deter our potential adversaries uh, from conducting this reckless behavior in, in cyberspace. Uh, and also because we've seen that the activities in cyberspace were only increasing. 
So cyberspace is a difficult one because there's no real distinction between peacetime, crisis, and war. Uh, it is a domain that is always on, uh, and therefore it's a domain where we don't have clear rules on defense and deterrence. What can you do? What can't you do? Uh, uh, so something that definitely after this conflict, uh, we'll have to look into again what the longer term implications are of this conflict on our cybersecurity. Resilience will play an important part in that. Um, so part of deterrence uh, uh, is also making sure that you're resilient to attacks. Um, if you uh, have to spend years to get into a network and then you're being kicked out in 10 seconds, uh, uh, then uh, that's a lot of effort for not a lot of fun. Uh, so resilience is, is definitely a part of that. This information is one where we're now seeing uh, the big impact on our societies of uh, propaganda. Uh, and uh, that's why Russia today has been banned in, 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 in most European countries at this uh, moment. Uh, and that's a big step to be taken. Um, so we have to rethink the balance on how do we maintain our freedom of speech, which is one of the highest goods in our democracy, and at the same time decrease the vulnerability of our populations to uh, propaganda and disinformation. Um, and in the modern digital connected world, that is a real challenge. Then let me, let me end uh, within this time, so we leave some time for questions, and Oli, of course, on energy security. Uh, and energy security, we've now seen that the dependence, in this case, on Russian oil and gas, uh, is on the one hand providing 1 billion uh, euros a day uh, to keep the Russian war machine going, uh, and it also makes us very vulnerable to coercion, uh, because we cannot stop that flow overnight uh, as it comes now. So independence of actors that, that are our competitors or adversaries uh, is something we need to work on as, as Europeans. Uh, and that goes for energy. Uh, but in the longer run, uh, if we transition into more greener energy, uh, we also have to make sure that we don't become dependent on other actors uh, that provide, for example, the rare earth minerals. Uh, or as we've seen in COVID, uh, that penicillin uh, uh, for 99% is only being made in China. So we are entering a world of geostrategic competition. Uh, uh, we need to take care of ourselves. Uh, and, and the gray zone uh, is definitely the area where uh, uh, most of this uh, competition will be fought out. And, and, and we're working on it. But uh, it's a whole of society effort. Thank you very much indeed, David. We'll come back to some of the points we you raised. We won't uh, we won't go into questions now. I'm now going to introduce Oli Rutu, who's the deputy chief executive of the European Defence Agency, and previously he served as deputy national armaments director of the Ministry of Defence of Finland. Uh, Mr. Rutu has been awarded the decoration of a Knight of the Order of the White Rose of Finland and a Medal for Military Merits. And when I saw that wonderful title, the Order of the White Rose, I hope that you do get every week a bunch of white roses sent to you as a result of having that knighthood. So I'll give you the floor now, Ollie, and then we'll come back to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much, and indeed for your uh, introduction as well. There were some white roses there on, uh, <laughs> on acknowledging it's a pleasure. Pleasure to be with uh, with you and, and all the distinguished members of the Institute of International and European Affairs today. And, and thank you for inviting uh, the European Defense Agency uh, to intervene in this panel discussion. It's, it's of greatest relevance, as you said uh, also today, and, and a pleasure also to follow uh, after the remarks of David van Vell there as well, uh, whom, with, with whom we very much share our understanding of the situation and the picture and many of the measures, of course, um, that, that uh, are currently taken forward. Now, this indeed Russian unprovoked military aggression against Ukraine uh, has already um, proved, proven to be a, a sea, sea change event for European sec security. And um, of course, it has already brought uh, commitments of, uh, of EU member states towards increased um, support um, to Ukraine, in the increased defense expenditure, and of course, the change of the EU's defense and security posture towards Russia. And um, uh, of course, as we all know, the armed aggression against Ukraine is using not only heavy military force, but also hybrid tactics, cyber attacks and foreign information, manipulation and interference, economic and energy coercion and, and so on. And 
of course, these uh, provocative actions severely and directly threaten uh, European security order and, and the security of European citizens. Now, um, last week, uh, the European Council endorsed the strategic compass, uh, which provides strategic guidance for the next decade, defines a coherent set of actions and means for strengthening the EU's security and defense policy. Um, the common strategic uh, vision requires a common understanding of the threats and challenges the EU will face in the future, uh, as today's uh, discussion rightly addresses. Um, the, for this reason, the work on the, on the strategic compass was first kicked off in November 2020 uh, in the EU's first ever comprehensive threat analysis. Um, and in, in some, this analysis has described a uh, European and global security landscape that is volatile, complex and fragmented uh, due to multi-layered threats and, and hybrid threats indeed grow both in frequency and impact um, and state and non-state actors target the EU with hybrid tools, including the misuse of disruptive technologies, cyber attacks, disinformation and other non-military sources of malign influence and terrorism. And of course, then um, this situation uh, of direct aggression and war in Ukraine that we are, we are having to, to witness. Um, to counter these threats uh, on, on the hybrid side, the EU committed to the development of a hybrid toolbox and response teams bringing together different instruments to detect and respond to a broad range of hybrid threats, including action to address foreign information manipulation and interference. And I, I must say uh, here that uh, I will focus more on the European Defence Agency's uh, activities on our support to member states, in particular in defense capability development, and then the European External Action Service is very much, of course, leading the work on the foreign information uh, uh, and, and, uh, and those hybrid areas. But we contribute to that work, and I will uh, say first a few words still on the, on the European Defense Agency here. Now, the strategic compass that I mentioned will also serve for us in the, in the agency as a main strategic reference. Um, we have now committed at the EU level to stimulate investment and innovation, jointly develop the necessary capabilities and technologies that the European Union member states need. Um, you may be aware that the agency was established uh, already more than 15 years ago, started its function in 2004, and it's there to help the member states to collaborate more to sustain their efforts to improve European defense capabilities and, and uh, improve, strengthen our common security and defense policy. And a few years back, a reinforced mandate was given by the defense ministers in 2017. And we work on main three lines of, of work. First of all, we prioritize what does Europe need for the future? And it's also very much in discussion now, what kind of European defense and European cooperation for capabilities we need? So we work on that prioritization. Secondly, it's a forum for cooperation and a management structure for capability development for technology activities. Um, and then thirdly, we uh, facilitate um, member states and, uh, and ministries of defense discussions with, also with the European Union Commission and other institutions to make sure that defense interests and the interests of defense are taken into account in EU policy development. So um, we have um, uh, here good increasing and, and active cooperation with the European Commission and the different tools that the EU toolbox has to address these threats and, and in, in an area uh, that we are discussing also today, the grey zone, uh, these tools are of course um, need to be exploited to the full and we, and we cooperate there actively. Now on, the, on what we do uh, on terms of the capability uh, development and support in the area of hybrid nature, uh, we first of all, we contribute to the implementation of the so-called joint framework to counter uh, hybrid threats. Uh, every year we report on our work to foster the resilience of the EU, member states, also partner countries, uh, in particular to an action in the, in the framework, which is on the adaptation or, uh, of defense capabilities to counter hybrid threats against one uh, or, or several participating main, member states. We have organized uh, tabletop exercises um, uh, which have brought us to identify hybrid warfare implications for European military capabilities. First, the, the key importance of civilian military interoperability, uh, connectivity and the need of additional exercises and training for, for demonstration. Uh, second, the necessity of maintaining uh, credible and comprehensive uh, uh, deterrence uh, in, in the sense of uh, deterring against the use of hybrid threats and lastly, 
the need to develop a common European picture of the hybrid warfare threat, with which the strategic compass is indeed now feeding. Now, in this context, uh, the, the capability development plan uh, that, that uh, we are uh, working together with member states and EU institutions on um, uh, gives, uh, gives, our, it gives our priorities on how to address uh, hybrid threats. Um, we, have, we have worked on this based on adaptive uh, scenarios and, uh, and a broad range of requirements ranging from, uh, from significant conventional military assets uh, over non-kinetic capabilities such as command and control, um, ISR, cyber, stratcom, and enhanced protection of infrastructure have been taken into account. And um, to be more specific, the EU capability development priorities agreed by the EDA steering board, so the defense ministers um, that also address hybrid threats are first enabling capabilities for cyber responsive operation. So it's improving cyber defense skills for military personnel, situational awareness, new technologies, coordination with other EU actors and training and education. Uh, in the area of ground combat capabilities, uh, we have a focus on enhanced protection of forces with the aim to develop counter IED capabilities in the context of hybrid threats. And then in the, in the naval area also, we have the underwater control contributing to resilience at sea with a focus on, on harbor protection. Uh, in the air domain, we focus on emphasis uh, on, on countering unmanned aerial systems uh, and, and this anti-access area denial capability. And then we look at a number of uh, innovative technologies for, uh, for example, for the protection against the CBRN threats, so chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear threats. So, um, and then we have uh, worked in more detail on, on different, let's say, avenues of approach of how we can increase collaboration there. Um, I have a number of examples on these areas, but in the interest of time and discussion, I will, I will just um, go maybe to, to conclude by, uh, again, emphasizing the importance of uh, investing in, in innovative technologies and in research uh, area. There is an under in investment at the European level in, in research and technology in our area uh, for some years now. And um, we know that the protection against the possible use of emerging disruptive technologies in a hybrid context, for example, through artificial intelligence, um, dependencies on position navigation, timing uh, technologies, uh, this should be explored from a capability development uh, perspective. And for instance, early detection and protective technologies to counter uh, CBRN, uh, CBRN threats uh, should be further developed and in, improved. And um, indeed, also in the strategic compass, um, uh, there is a commitment to the creation of a defense innovation hub in the European Defense Agency, which we'll, uh, we are developing together with member states right now. Um, and, and to conclude, important again that we um, coordinate with all the uh, uh, actors involved in the domain, um, including uh, in a good stuff to start dialogue with NATO that we are also having, and, uh, um, and we will be work organizing work, I'm sure, with higher intensity from here on, looking at the current situation. So um, um, indeed, our cooperation has a very important signal value um, and it provides concrete uh, support and capabilities in the situation. So we look forward to, to continuing on that and um, grateful um, for any questions and discussion after this. Thank you very much.